reflect on the national media's response to the Ferguson conflict, see how Ladue students peacefully assemble, and investigate the schedule changes. Hello and welcome to Ladue View. I'm Lillian Donahue. And I'm Caitlin Crawford, and this is How We Roll. Just 10 miles north of Ladue, the community of Ferguson is recovering from the grand jury decision not to indict police officer Darren Wilson after he killed 18-year-old Michael Brown. The media storm surrounding the city of Ferguson has shown every extreme, from highlighting the needs for change in police action to generalizing a diverse population. I took to Forest Park to ask the community of St. Louis for their reactions to the national spotlight. County police have taken over the investigation of a shooting by a Ferguson police officer that left a teenager dead. A it happened at the Canfield Green apartment complex on in their Ferguson. Hands here. For a second night of unrest with the death of Michael Brown, oh God. police in From CNN to Twitter, every day you can expect to see the latest on Ferguson, Missouri. The St. Louis community in the midst of a highly publicized local change after the death of Michael Brown in August 2014. However, to many St. Louisans, the public spotlight may have hindered the nation's view of their city rather than help it. When you look at national media, it shows that it's, you know, the entire city is burning down. Um, so it sucks that that's the national view of it. Um, when you come down here, there is, you know, they need to focus on the peaceful protest that has been happening uh, rather than the riots that took place. But I don't believe St. Louis is, I don't think that's the, the representation of St. Louis as a whole. Mm -hmm. There are bad apples in whatever city you go to. I heard somebody say they got off an airplane, they expected the city to be burning. It's not. You're not going to find the city burning. You may go to Ferguson, and from here to the front of that building, it's chaos. But you got to fill that with something positive. And if you don't, you're just opening yourself up to eat the wrong thing and put it back out. I think with today's media, we have infinite sources of information and so it's not actually a full spread of information and so there's just you take everything with a grain of salt understanding that you're not seeing this, the full picture. Ferguson is complicated. You have to consider the historical context of the St. Louis area. WGRZ TV reporter Danny Spiewak was able to connect his hometown of St. Louis to Buffalo, New York from behind a journalistic lens. So I did a story comparing Buffalo and St. Louis, and then what Buffalo could learn from what was happening in Ferguson, and kind of putting Ferguson into context, too. I think a lot of people nationally didn't understand the makeup of St. Louis, the history of St. Louis, and I think they were sort of just pigeonholing things into kind of this fantasy that they had created at the St. Louis area that may not have been true. Today's fast-paced social media influence also opens up many opportunities for misperceptions of mass information. Anyone on Twitter can say anything. And if it gets retweeted enough times, it becomes fact, even if it's not. So I think the biggest challenge for the media will be to kind of weed out the journalists from the non-journalists, weed out the nonsense on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everything, um, and just sort of uh, get back to the, the basics of what it's supposed to be. Despite a time of social adversity and national attention, there's one theme that resonates loud and clear within the St. Louis community. St. Louis is home for me, I know that much. It has that really homey thing that just kind of anchors people, for better or worse. St. Louis is a, it's like a machine, you know what I mean? It's like a big animal. You got to be careful what you feed it, because anything you eat, you're going to put out the other end. So, you know, when you feed it the wrong thing, it's going to put out the wrong thing. So it's just, you know, you got to be careful what you eat, you know, because it will come back. I'm Lillian Donahue reporting for Ladue View. McClure North historically is home to many great athletic teams, football in particular. This year they were off to a great start, but with civil unrest in Ferguson, the team felt the effects on the field. Delisa Puckett reports. This is a pretty good team. I'm excited about the whole team, period. Team goal uh, from day one has been to go to state. Um, you know, and a lot of people say, well, this is your first year. Um, you know, it's going to be a rebuilding year. But when you have talent like this, 
you know, and as a coach, you have to be real with yourself. If you know you have talent, then, uh, you know, you know, play like it, coach like it, expect big things. The rebuilding year was not the only problem the McClure North Stars faced. On August 9, 2014, an unarmed black teen, Michael Brown, was shot and killed and left the town of Ferguson unrest. You know, and it was just a tragic, uh, you know, s something that unfortunately happened. Um, it, it affected the school district, you know, in, in regards to us not having a, you know, a place to practice, a place to go to school, you know, uh, because it did happen in Ferguson. Uh, but I think we kept going. We persevered through that time as a team. It, it, I mean, it hurt everybody. I mean, even the people who weren't really connected to it, everybody was hurt. I mean, we all had to miss days of practice or we had to go other places. We couldn't be at home practicing because that happened. Despite their setbacks, McClure North used football to stay positive and influence their community. Everything that football has uh, taught me, I'm, I'm that man because of football. Uh, like I tell the kids all the time, I didn't get this position as a head coach because of, uh, you know, me just knowing how to play football, but football taught me how to be a person. And when I walked in this building, ninth grade, you know, um, the relationships that I built with staff members and old teammates, that helped me get this job, you know. It was so, it was, I laid the foundation from then. Football lays a foundation in young men, so that's why I love this game, foundation. And I'm Julie Sapuckett, reporting for Ladivia. The issues raised out of Michael Brown's death have had a broad effect on students across the country. In fact, Brown's mother, Les Leslie McSpadden, is a Ladue alum. On Friday, December 5th, a few hundred students walked out of their classrooms to stage a die-in to com combat police brutality and promote racial equality. They remained on the ground for four and a half minutes to symbolize the four and a half hours Brown was on the street. For more on this story, visit our website at www.lhstv.weebly.com. Just as education and generations change, so does our school's schedule. Recently, it has bounced around the building that a new, even controversial amendment may be made to our schedule next year. Jack Levy is live in the lab. Jack? Thanks, Lillian. Come 9.30, this room will be filled with students doing their homework and finishing their final projects. For years, Academic Lab has been a staple in a Ladue student's schedule but under new administrative review, this time for homework and student-teacher conference may see a new form. Reporter Marissa Glantz investigates. Any successful organization has to take a look at what it does and not be afraid to ask and re-examine its practices uh, with what's in the best interests uh, of students being the primary objective. All around Ladue High School, there's been talks about a schedule change. And Mr. Griffith is working very hard with the high school staff to get a lot of input on making some changes in the schedule that better suit um, addressing the needs of all of our students. There have been some things that have been, I guess, once, once you start talking about the schedule, everybody gets very much interested in academic lab. Many students worry about the possibility of no ACK lab and how it could affect their education. I think that it would really disrupt students' like work ethic because we really need like ACK lab to get organized and like get stuff done. And if you you know had like a really busy night the night before, you still have time to like do your homework and turn things in on time. Um, I know that our staff and our administration are really committed to doing what's best for students. So looking at a schedule through that lens, I think, is really important. Instead of completely eliminating ACK Lab, the administration is focusing on looking at the time differently. I guess one benefit would be that people that don't use their time effectively would be forced to use their time more effectively like at home, so actually like do their work at home, but for, the most, of the, for the most of the students here, I think that we use the time to talk to teachers and like actually get stuff done, so I think it, for the most part, would harm the students. I fully support um, these ideas that staff members have that they want to put into place. Um, I think anytime we try to make improvements for kids 
and we, we focus on that goal of all of our students learning at the highest possible level, uh, we can't go wrong. So I'm, I'm really pleased with the work the high school is doing, and I think it's, um, I think it's moving in the right direction. For Ladue View, I'm Marissa Glantz. With drumsticks in hand and, pow and a powerful message to deliver, Jeff Mazingo and Joe Richardson came to Ladue to speak to the current freshman class. Edan Goldfarb listens to how these two men blend music and life choices to inspire students around the nation. So, our assembly is, we like to talk about choices in life, and Jeff touched on it. I do this because I lost my son two years ago to a heroin overdose, and I wanted to get out and try to make a difference. I didn't want to see this happen to any more kids or parents go through this pain. And my goal is to go out and help and save kids. I thought it was really moving, like how that guy lost his son. And uh, it just kind of puts things in perspective how drugs can claim your life. I didn't want to just sit back and not do anything. A lot of parents don't want it to be known, don't want to know any different about any of it. I wanted to educate myself so I could go out and help other people. So that's what the Awaken Project is about. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to come into schools and talk to kids and students about drug awareness and music advocacy, which is that's what my part of the program is, is the music advocacy. And uh, we come in here and I give them kind of a rock concert with drums and backing tracks and lights and uh, uh, really upbeat music to give them an idea of how passionate I am about music in general. Just absolutely love what I do, but I've made right choices, and so many students today are making wrong choices. The wrong choice being the worst choice you can make is heroin. And that's what we're here to talk to schools uh, about and students about. So you have choices in life. I don't know about you, I kind of like driving around the country. I kind of like going on vacations. I kind of like my family. I kind of like my friends. That's all taken away from you when you make the wrong choice. For the due view, I'm Don Goldfarb. On November 20th, Elise and Chris Nonheim had a surprising and emotional reunion during the second hour. Take a look. I just surprised my little sister, Elise Nonheim. I've been on deployment nine months, and I haven't seen her in about nine months. Um, and so I just surprised her. It was a little emotional. <laughs> Is it good to have sis home? I'm kind of surprised you. <laughs> That's all we have for today. Thank you very much for watching Ladue View. I'm Lillian Donahue. And I'm Caitlin Crawford. Have a great day.